Hi, I'm Susan Wise Bauer, co author of The Well Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. And welcome to season two of The Well Trained Mind Podcast. Yay! <laughs> we're officially here for our second season. We're very excited. Um, if you weren't here for season one or haven't checked it out yet, we focused that season on all things classical education. So we talked about what it is, what it isn't, how it works in different settings and with different kinds of students. Where it might be going, where it came right. from. All kinds of stuff. Yes. All sort of. Oh, we had, and we had some wonderful guests too. So please go back and listen to that season. But you can also just join us now. And uh, we are switching gears a little bit. We talked a lot about sort of the philosophy and history of classical education. We want to really drill in on nuts and bolts in this season, mm -hmm. really just jump into specific curricula, principles, tips, challenges for teaching subjects, you know, math, history, science, writing and languages. We really want to give parents some super practical tools in this season. Yes. I love it when a book or a podcast has hows, actionable tricks and tips that I can apply in my life. So we're going to try to offer as many as we can this season. Absolutely. Yep. And we are starting off episode one at the very beginning, because it's a very good place to start <laughs> with preschool. And what does it look like to do classical education before formal instruction begins? Or what must my children learn? What should they be learning? Is there anything they should be doing at all at this stage? Is it going to do more harm than good to try to do school before they're six or seven years old? So we're going to dive into that today. And you know, there's so much pressure on parents. Should my kid already be doing school? I mean, my my four-year-old neighbor is coming home with worksheets. Are we already behind? Um, mm -hmm. If you plan to eventually send your child into a classroom, how are you going to make sure that they're at the proper level? Uh, on the other hand, if you do school too early, will it kill their love of learning? There's just, I mean, I, I say this both as an educator and as a parent. When your children are young, and particularly when your first children are young, I mean, mm -hmm. this is this is very very much a, a, a sort of an oldest child phenomenon. You're just convinced you're doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. And, and I think the truth is that there are a lot of, how should I put this, publishers and curricular developers mm -hmm. who kind of depend on that pressure and depend mm -hmm. on that fear mm -hmm. in order to market materials to parents. That's interesting. And on top of that pressure coming from all sorts of sources to make sure I'm, I'm doing it right. I'm doing the right thing for my child. There's also a wide variety of approaches and answers to those questions with very strong opinions behind them. Everything very from, strong. <laughs> you know, formal schooling will do more harm than good at this age, all the way to don't let your kids start school behind. Don't you dare send your kid into a classroom if they don't know X, Y, and Z. And so there's a lot of strong opinions that I'm sure only just increase the pressure. Absolutely. And I'm going to say something that I'll probably repeat. I think I've said it in last season. I'll probably repeat it this season. As a parent, you have to be very aware uh, of when fear is being mm. used to convince you of a particular course of action. So mm -hmm. anytime you hear a publisher, a curricular development, a review site, any anyone say, if you don't do this, a bad mm -hmm. thing will happen. Yeah. All of your alarm bells should go off because you rarely make the right decision for your child when you are operating out of fear of what might happen in the future, as opposed to what is good for that particular child in this moment right now. Mm. Those are just two things you have to remember. Always ask yourself, and I think this is particularly true when you're dealing with preschoolers, am I doing this out of fear of what might happen in the future or am I doing it because this kid is ready to do this right now? Right. That makes a lot of sense. And ultimately, and I'm sure we'll reiterate this throughout the episode as well. Ultimately, you know your child. Yes. And it, it's interesting because it's easy to fall in this trap of like, once they turn four or five, we want them to be hitting these developmental milestones. We, we're looking for these certain things. We're expecting certain things. But if you think about it, we don't expect all kids to become 30 pounds at the same age. We don't expect them to be 40 inches tall at the same age. We don't expect them to learn to walk or how to talk at the same time. And so that doesn't just automatically change with school related things. It might feel that way because you can get to kindergarten 
kindergarten and there's common core standards that say Mm -hmm. your child should be able to read, but children develop differently and you're the one who knows your child the most. And you're the one who knows, you know, you're watching your child and you're, you're seeing what they need when. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very, very hard to have confidence when you're a first time parent, which Mm -hmm. makes complete sense. You've never done this before, but (laughs) <laughs> the truth is parents overbuy for preschool just enormously. They buy mm. all sorts of things that they don't need and probably half of them they're not even going to use. And, you know, I have to say as a publisher, I have seen over the many years of being a publisher of educational materials, how much easier it is to sell materials for young children mm-hmm. than for middle grade or high school kids. Because by middle grade and high school, parents are starting to figure out that they don't have to do everything. Mm. So, you know, as a publisher, I kind of appreciate what that that panic buying does for the bottom line. Right. But, you know, as an educator and as a parent, I would say buy less. Don't mm-hmm. buy more. Start small. Just do a few things. And, you know, it's tricky because everything is so shiny and you've right. never done it before. You want to <laughs> buy it all, you know, but you don't need to. So don't overbuy for preschool. And that's going to be, I think, one of the things that we're going to really repeat as we go through some of our recommendations here. We're going to sound like, have you heard of de-influencers? I have not, but I love that phrase. (laughs) It's a new term because there's so many influencers on, you know, people saying, you know, try this product, try that product. There's a new thing called de-influencers, which I run into a lot because I don't think I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but I'm pregnant right now. And so there's all these lists that I'm all into right now. What do you need for your baby? What do I need to have in the nursery Mm. before the baby comes out? And so I appreciate these de-influencers who tell me everything I don't need. And so (laughs) that is part of what we're doing today. (laughs) Do you find yourself tempted to overbuy for your... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I just I want to make sure I have everything. <laughs> and it's also cute. <laughs> exactly. Um, so before I get too far off track with oh, baby yeah. clothes and baby things, um, mm-hmm. I thought it'd be a good idea to start out by briefly describing the preschool years at a brain development level and kind of talk about what we're dealing with with children of this age. And I think we're talking about well, what age range would you like to use for, for today's? For preschool, I would say I would say below six. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So let's say five, five and under, but also recognize that, you know, with the natural variance and maturing, Mm -hmm. some six-year-olds might still be operating on a preschool level and some five-year-olds might be ready to move on and do first grade work. So, you know, that, that depends on the individual child. But I think, I think there are, I think there are three main things to keep in mind just in terms of the way that preschool Mm -hmm. children um, approach work. First of all, they have super absorbent minds. And that's Mm -hmm. something, of course, that we talk about in The Well-Trained Mind. We talked about it last season as part of the grammar stage of education Mm -hmm. is that they really do soak up information quickly. And they're just very, they're very naturally curious, which is Mm -hmm. wonderful. It doesn't matter whether something is going to be useful or whether they see the point of it. They're just interested in things, which is such a lovely quality. And you do kind of want to follow that quality, follow that enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. As you plan out what you're going to do with your preschooler, they're, you know, not only absorbent, but naturally curious, but also keep in mind that having a very, 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 very short attention span is completely normal. And Mm -hmm. it shouldn't actually be one of your goals to improve the attention span because that's something Mm -hmm. that just happens Mm -hmm. with maturity. It should be your goal to follow up on their curiosity and give them things to absorb within that very short attention span. And we're probably talking eight to 10 minutes. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Maybe for a three or four year old, even five minutes. Mm -hmm. And from, from a Montessori perspective, they call the whole first, what we would call grammar stage. It's a, it's, it's a little different. It's zero to six. They call it the absorbent mind plane mm. or a stage mm-hmm. of development. You can hardly, kids can hardly not learn during this time period. Yeah, They're going to be watching you. They're going to be picking things up. And we'll talk about this more later, but like when you have a language rich environment, when there's things going on around them, they are going to be learning almost no matter what you do. Right. But as far as sitting down and focusing five to 10 minutes is usually all that they can take. Yes. And then they've got to wiggle. Yep. <laughs> you got to get up and wiggle. Um, now, and this is something that that you're going to hear me soapbox on repeatedly, hand muscles. Oh, mm-hmm. my goodness, hand muscles. So because so much preschool learning material is sort of based on a classroom, you know, it assumes that kids are going to be going to a preschool and a teacher is going to have a whole group of these kids and they're going to have to do something. Way too much preschool learning is focused mm-hmm. on worksheet sort of stuff. 
Children at this age can actually absorb a lot of material, but that should be done orally and orally, right? By speaking Mm -hmm. and by listening. Their little hand muscles at this age are still developing. And if they write their name, that can be it for the day. That can be Mm -hmm. all that they can actually do. And so it's it's very easy to overstress those little hand muscles um, because you're following up on all that national curiosity. And they've got this great worksheet with lots of colored pictures on it. And the first thing they do is write their name on the top of it. And by the time they've written their name, they're finished. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I remember last time we were at a convention talking about well-trained mind materials, a a parent came up to me and was really concerned because they had first language lessons and they thought they were missing a component. They're like, where's the worksheet part Mm -hmm. of this first volume of first language lessons? But it's on purpose that those lessons are so short and are almost exclusively oral because that's what kids just starting to get into school age. That's even beyond what we're talking about here, but just starting to get into school age, that's what they're ready for. But it can kind of be a shock as a parent of like, where's, where, where are the worksheets? Where's the actual product? You yes. know, because we want to see product. We want something to put on the refrigerator. <laughs> right. Well, and of course, preschool children, and we're going to talk about this in a minute when we get to specific recommendations. Of course, preschool children do need to practice their handwriting. They mm-hmm. do need to, to develop those muscles. But the purpose of doing a worksheet or mm-hmm. some sort of written assignment should be to write, mm-hmm. to exercise those hand muscles. It shouldn't be connected to learning something about the natural world or learning how to read or, mm-hmm. or learning something about mummies in Egypt. That mm-hmm. should be something done separately in a way that doesn't stress the little hand. Right. And if you and you almost want to save the hand muscles for when they need it for writing, yep. save that energy for the things that can only be done on paper. Absolutely. So I, I think then that we could I think that we could we could lay out a few mm-hmm. basic principles. With, and mm-hmm. again, we're going to give you some specific uh, recommendations. But I think number one, don't push a preschool child into formal education activities, by which I think mm-hmm. we're meaning worksheets curricula, Mm. workbooks, something that says every day here is what you must do in order to get to the next stage of education. Right. Absolutely. And those, those are things where, where you talk about that fear, we feel like, oh, wait, do I need to be doing this yet? No, you don't need to be doing it yet. Especially if your student isn't asking for it, isn't wanting it. They can learn so much just by their environment just by the things around them. And we'll talk about creating an environment uh, later in this episode. But Mm -hmm. um, informal activities, being in an educational environment, that's really enough at this age. Yeah. And so what you really want to keep your eye on are sort of three things. Mm -hmm. Number one, basic reading. Mm -hmm. Yes, a preschool child is definitely ready to learn how to sound out words. Mm -hmm. So a phonics program that teaches students the letters, the sounds of the letters, and how to begin to put those letters together in combination, beginning with short vowel three-letter words. And then as the child is ready, progressing on through blends and some of the, you know, slightly more difficult rules of phonics, that you can begin any time that the child is mature enough to spend five minutes sitting next to you and looking at the phonics book. This Mm -hmm. should not incorporate writing. Mm. Remember that little hand and it can be five minutes a day. Mm -hmm. The sooner you do that, the more of a of an advantage they're going to have as their curiosity leads them in different directions. You're you're starting to unlock for them a whole world of information that they can then absorb. Mm -hmm. But that'd be the number one thing for this language rich environment, this this environment where they can learn. Number Mm -hmm. one would be basic phonics starting with five minutes a day as soon as they show any curiosity. And with that, just a quick caveat, this might be obvious, but when you're looking for programs to work with, some reading programs do teach writing side by side with mm-hmm. reading. So that can be a red flag uh, for a particular program. Yeah, definitely. If if the program is dependent on the student learning to write the sounds that they're learning how to read, I would not do that. Some programs just have a writing, handwriting element that you can mm-hmm. easily ignore. And here's another principle for parents of preschoolers. It's okay to ignore something in the curriculum. Mm-hmm. Just because it's in there doesn't mean that you should do it. You you should listen to your gut instinct as to whether your child is ready to do that or not. So learning environment, basic phonics, basic math. So let's talk about basic math for a minute. Mm-hmm. 
Susanna, what do you think of when I say the words basic math? Well, I don't like math very much. So my heart rate goes up when you say the word math. (laughs) (laughs) See, this is a really good response. I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. That's the the thing I'm most scared to teach. (laughs) (laughs) Well, but but when the thing is with preschoolers, Mm -hmm. basic math just means that you're teaching them the relationship between numbers and things in the real world. Mm. Okay, so... Along with doing some basic phonics, um, basic math means that you count everything. You count how many apples are in the bowl on the table. You count how many steps you took down the, you know, down the walk mm. to get to your car. You just get in the habit of counting everything. And you get in the habit of drawing correlations between Mm -hmm. objects and the things that you're doing with them. That sounded vague. Let me be Mm -hmm. more precise. I I always sounded like an idiot when I was grocery shopping with my children because I talked to them (laughs) all the time. And I would say, hey, there are five people in our family. There's me, there's dad, there's Emily, there's Christopher, there's Dan. There's five people here. How many carrots should we get if all five of them get one carrot? We should get five carrots. (laughs) One for dad, one for, you know, and we just Mm. did that all of the time. I would say, Oh, I got six carrots. I'm going to put one back. Now I have five carrots. So sort of just getting yourself into the habit of Mm -hmm. counting and making an association between like people and vegetables or, Mm -hmm. you know, anything like that. That is the best preschool math program that Mm. you can do with your small children. That makes sense. And I love that story because it goes on to illustrate how at this age, math and and really all instruction can just happen in your life, in your daily life, while you're tying your shoes, while you're cooking, while you're at the grocery store, mm-hmm. you're talking out loud and they're learning and they're absorbing with their little absorbent minds. Well, and you know, you, you teach children to speak by speaking Mm -hmm. to them. You teach Mm -hmm. them to tie their shoes by tying their shoes with them. Mm -hmm. You teach them to pick up their toys by picking up their toys side by side with them. You know, in each each of these sort of like basic life skills, you do it along with them and show them what to do. And that's what you do with reading and with math. You Mm -hmm. read aloud to them you walk them through basic phonics, you talk to them about numbers, you show them how you use numbers in daily life. Creating a learning rich environment has Mm -hmm. so much to do with talking. Mm. I have spoken to parents who, you know, basically say, well, we just don't talk that much around the house. Okay, Mm -hmm. I get that. That's your particular relational style. Maybe you grew up, you know, with silent parents. But Mm -hmm. kids who don't hear a lot of talking around them will struggle more academically Mm. because they're not accustomed to using spoken and heard language to sort through information and make sense of it. Right. That makes sense. So then we've got basic phonics. We've got basic math. You mentioned one more thing for this age. Ah, so this is actually one of my favorites, and it's it's something that may be a little bit more obscure, but it has to do with them. Um, okay, this is going to sound this is going to sound more complicated than it actually is. It has to do with thinking skills. So one of the things that's super important with young children is for them to hear you plan out things that you're going to do. Mm-hmm. All right, I'll use another cooking example just because I spent a lot of time in the kitchen when my kids were little cooking. So I'm going to make some chicken for dinner. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the oven on. We're going to have to wait for the oven to heat up. Then I'm going to pull out a pan. I guess I'd better grease the pan. I don't want the chicken to stick. And then I'm going to get the chicken out of the uh, out of the refrigerator. And I think we'd better put some salt and pepper on it. This may sound silly, but what I'm doing there is I'm demonstrating for my kids how to order a set of tasks and do them mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. at a time. That's what I mean by by thinking skills. This mm-hmm. is the beginning of critical thinking and you do it when they're really little. Hey, we're going to go to the library. Before we go to the library, what are three things we're going to need to do? We're going to need to collect our books. I guess that means we better go find our book bags. So after we do those two things, we've got to be ready to go out the door. What do you need to do in order to be ready to go out the door? You should brush your hair. You should go to the bathroom. You know, mm-hmm. just constantly articulating those steps for children is one of the things that really helps to develop sequential thinking in their minds. And here again, you don't need a curricula to do this. It can be a bit of a challenge again for people who are sort of, you know, naturally less 
talkers. I mean, I talk all the time. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the same category. <laughs> you talk all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already talking to this baby, like when I cook, <laughs> explaining what I'm doing. There because it go. used to just be I was like pretending I was on a cooking show, but now I'm, I tell my husband that I'm teaching the baby how to cook. So you, there it's a you little go. less embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, it can feel unnatural at first to like talk and explain your thinking. But that's part of what I'm trying to do when I'm like talking as I cook now is just practicing articulating my thoughts and articulating and, and, and being willing to just speak as I do things. And um, because I have heard and mm -hmm. seen a lot of research that it has a huge benefit on kids from the time they're born, mm -hmm. really, um, and all the way through preschool. Now, of course, we should say that if your child really does want to do school and there are kids who they just love the idea of doing school. If you have a younger child who can see an older sibling doing school, they're going to really want to do school. There's right. absolutely nothing wrong with that. We have some great recommendations in The Well-Trained Mind that you've got. You have listed three here, Susanna, mm -hmm. that you thought would be particularly helpful. Yeah, I, I wanted to give something, some media recommendations, because like you said, you've got a four-year-old and she has an older sister and brother that are doing school around her. And one thing you could do is just kind of include her in some of the things she can be included on. When I was when I was younger, I love sitting in to hear the stories that my older siblings were hearing in Story of the World, things like that. Um, but as far as doing school for themselves, um, there's Preschool Math at Home by Kate Snow, which we publish. That is a really great introduction to it's not a formal curricula, but it gives you really fun activities and ideas for developing that math thinking at the preschool age. I also feel like it, it gives parents a little bit of that guidance in how to talk mm -hmm. about math because it's got mm -hmm. fun games in it that you play with your kid. That so, so it sort of gives you a leg up on developing that that basic math conversation um, if that's yeah. not something that's natural to you. Yeah, absolutely. When la the last convention I was at, I had so many parents come up to me just raving about that particular book. So if you're a little scared of teaching math like I am, just having a read through of that could be really helpful. There's also like big books like the Toddler Busy Book by Trish Kuffner or the Complete Daily Curriculum for Early Childhood by Pam Schiller and Pat Phipps. Mm -hmm. And I can put these in the show notes, but these are just examples of, of books that give you a, a whole bunch of activities that you can do with a preschooler that are, that are educational, that are developmentally appropriate, that are fun. And it kind of solves a lot of the prep work for you by having it all in one place. So those are some fun ones. If your child is asking for school, because some kids will, mm -hmm. they really want to get started. They're excited and enthusiastic. And we want to follow up on that enthusiasm. Although I do think it's important not to mistake enthusiasm for maturity. Just because a kid says, I want to do school, and mm -hmm. then they lose interest two minutes after you pull the book out, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything is wrong. It just means, it's, mm -hmm. you know, their, their, their reach exceeds their grasp. That's fine. After two minutes, if they say they're bored, say, okay, that's great. Why don't you go run right. around the house? Right. That's your preschool. Right. When I was nannying um, in high school, I nannied for a family of four and two would go off to school. And then the younger two were home with me and the younger two would be inevitably, I want to, I want to go to school. What that meant was they wanted to put something in a backpack and walk oh, around yes, the house with was... it. It didn't mean they wanted to really do school. <laughs> but, you know. I love that. I love that. Everybody needs a backpack. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thankfully, they had backpacks and we could play school. Let's see if we can sort of if we can sort of uh, sum up or or outline this whole idea of creating a positive learning environment for these pre-grammar stage children, these preschool children. So what we're going to say, you know, to start off with is if they want to do school, great, mm -hmm. get a curriculum, get a book, but mostly, you know, you're going to just, you're going to let that develop naturally. You're going to be guided by their inclination as to how much quote unquote school you do. But there are some very practical things you can do with them. Um, and the first mm -hmm. one, Susanna, is of course everyone's favorite limiting screen time <laughs> alas it is a hard one though and i and i i was with a friend the other day because now you know my friends are coming into the age of, of having 
young children. And it is so tempting. I I can see how just a phone buys you 10 minutes. You know, you're trying Mm -hmm. to finish your conversation at the coffee shop and the phone, it buys you that 10 minutes you need to finish the conversation or or else you would just have to leave, you know. Um, So screen time is a really, really hard one. But at the same time, I think we have to be really cautious about this, edu- you know, educational programming, iPad mm-hmm. games that that say that they'll teach your child amazing things and thus be sort of a best of both worlds. They're entertained. They're not bothering you, but they're also learning. I think we need to be careful with that, because if you think about what really is a classical education, and we talked about this last season, it's a language rich education. And if, and if at a very young age, students are associating learning with sort of really colorful, loud TV shows and games and iPad games, it is going to make that transition to real school where they're challenging themselves with language rich curriculum a lot harder. And I think, you know, as I, I speak as someone who at one time had four children under the age of 10, there's nothing wrong with help. You know, if, they, mm-hmm. if you are so tired that you cannot continue on and you have to sit down for half an hour and have a cup of tea and eat some chocolate before you can go on with your day, or if, you know, the phone rings and your mother is needs you to, sorry, this is moving into my, my life now, needs you, you to come help her do something that she is no longer strong enough to do. Well, then, OK, right. yeah, stick on a video, mm-hmm. give the kid an iPad. That's fine. It's entertainment. We need right. to use entertainment to help us get through the day very often because we don't live, you know, in a world with unlimited time and unlimited energy. I right. think what you emphasize there, Susanna, which is so important, is don't confuse that with education. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you're going to have to be with yourself, I think, a little bit tough minded when it comes to is this educational? For mm-hmm. children under six, if it involves a screen, it's probably not educational. It's entertainment. There's nothing wrong with entertainment. Just don't sort of fool yourself by calling Mm -hmm. something education if it actually is entertainment. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to sum that up. I Listen, I'm a fan of not losing your mind. If you need a video to not lose your mind, that's fine. (laughs) Okay, second one. So a limit screen time. And I I think I would just let me just say this one more time. Limit Mm -hmm. screen time means don't confuse entertainment Mm -hmm. and education and realize that for children under six screens are almost always entertainment. And number two, and this is one of my favorites, because I didn't realize this until my mother pointed it out to me. It is every child's natural inclination to draw circles in a clockwise direction. And I have no idea why that (laughs) is. But if you watch it, 98% of all young children, if they're going to draw a snowman or a slinky or whatever, they're going to draw circles in a clockwise direction. Guess what one of the great truths about English language handwriting is? All of the circles are counterclockwise. Yikes. (laughs) A, B, C, D. Think about it. So I have no idea why this is, but one of the ways in which you can give preschoolers a real jump on their handwriting practice is, you know, when they're doing those big circles, try to encourage them to do them counterclockwise. Do them Mm. with them, you know, do curls of smoke, do anything that involves lots and lots of circles and try to do them counterclockwise. Um, that'll just, that'll, that'll just give their, their, not only their fine muscles in their hand, but also the brain hand connection, Mm -hmm. a really good workout that will prepare them for handwriting. That's great. So simple, but will be super helpful later on as far as setting them up for success. Absolutely. Um, Number three, we have do daily counting activities in Mm -hmm. life. And we've talked about this already, but just incorporating into your trip to the grocery store or Mm -hmm. cooking a meal. Let's count these chocolate chips. How many are we going to put in this cookie or whatever? Mm -hmm. Um, Just incorporating counting and numbers in your daily life. Lining up things side by side. Not only do I have five chocolate chips, but if I were to put a raisin next to each chocolate chip, how many raisins would I have? Five. Mm. How many do I have all together? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think the key to remember here is that anything physical can be counted. Objects, pieces of food, the 
actions that you take. I'm going to brush my hair 20 times. Do people still do that? I feel like that no, was, I don't, think, I don't so. think so. The the new thing is really to not brush your hair as much oh, really? as possible. Well, maybe this is I'm trying to figure out my I have very thick hair and I'm on a journey to figure out how to maintain it. But like being careful about not brushing it too much is something I've heard. Wow, that would have made my life with my daughter so much easier. <laughs> OK, <laughs> let's not get too distracted here. Um, yes, but you know, OK, so not that. Oh, but brushing teeth. I, you know, right. one, two, three, four. You could definitely do it with brushing teeth. Right. Um, and I don't know that I would do this with really young children, but as they get older too, you can do skip counting. Mm -hmm. So, hey, we're going to walk down, but I'm only going to use a number every other step. Two, four, six, eight. Mm. You, know? you can use skip counting. You can also use skip counting if you're uh, doing hide and seek. You could say, I'm going to count to 10 by twos. And I'm going to come get you when I get to 10. You know, mm -hmm. all of these all of these things um, are ways that you can introduce them to 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 basic math in a non scary way. They Love wouldn't it. frighten you, Susanna. Right. Even I could do that. I can do that. <laughs> I can skip count with my child. That's encouraging. Now, you can skip count and you can do it by fives. You could do it by tens. Right. Oh, my goodness. There's so many things you can do. Awesome. Um, so we already mentioned this. And actually, uh -huh. this is sort of the basis of everything we're saying. But talk. Talk, talk, yeah. talk, talk, not baby talk, narrate what you're doing, talk mm -hmm. in complete sentences. I will mm. say again, from the experience of having been the mother of small children, it's really easy to get into a pattern of sort of grunting and single word. <laughs> <laughs> no, stop, sit, shoes, you, there, no, spill. Right. You know, um, <laughs> it, it's just a thing that happens because you get tired and you know your attention is divided. So right. trying to remind yourself to speak mm -hmm. in complete Complete sentences is really, really important in terms of, you know, a preschool child's general development. Right. And also encouraging them to talk. And I mean, by the time they're preschool age, most kids will be really talking anyway, but, you know, letting them, um, letting them express themselves and not maybe running because you're so good at reading their mind, you know what they want when they point or grunt or, right. um, but yes. letting them talk as well. And I will, I will, again, from my own experience, I will say younger children sometimes get the, the short end of the stick on this one, because if you've done a good job with the older siblings, they just talk all of the time. Mm -hmm. And it gets, it's very easy for younger children to actually get in the habit of pointing and then somebody mm -hmm. gives them what they want because it's easier than fighting their very verbal siblings for space. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't mind me telling you this. My youngest child, who's now, you know, a grown up in her senior year of college, wow. um, actually had to go to speech therapy for a stutter because her brothers. Well, I'm sure there were other reasons as well, but her brothers interrupted her and oh, talked no. over top of her so unceasingly that she literally could not get a word in edgewise. Oh, you know? no. So and and I was so overwhelmed, you know, with all these right. kids that I didn't notice what was going on. So a lot of the speech therapy was just the therapist sitting there with her and waiting until she got something out. She was so sure she was going to get cut off if she didn't speak quickly enough uh -huh. that she'd had actually developed a stutter. So if I could do it again... At our family dinners, we always used to do a thing at family dinners where everybody had to say the best thing that happened during the day and the worst thing that happened during the mm. day. And our rule became that they could say as many best things as they mm -hmm. wanted to, but they could only pick one worst thing because mm -hmm. a couple of my kids would just spend the entire time listing bad <laughs> things. You know, If I could do it again, I would actually say for the next five minutes, Emily is the only one that gets to talk. Mm -hmm. Everybody else needs to listen or something like that. So that's that's just my uh, that's my caution about younger yeah. children in very verbal households. Absolutely. And that's a good thing to keep in mind for for younger kids, because also your well-intentioned older children may also learn their needs just like you have and be able to meet their needs or get them what they need without them having to speak in full sentences. So yeah, exactly. Maybe keep in mind. The next point is similar. It's just to read, read, read. There's yes, so many indeed. ways you can incorporate reading into your life, whether it's listening to audiobooks in the car or them seeing you read, reading signs when you're out and about in the real world, billboards, the backs of cereal boxes, bumper stickers. Be careful about those. Yeah. Maybe pre-read the bumper <laughs> stickers before you start <laughs> just reading anything you see on the street. Um, but um, reading stories and asking appropriate questions about the stories. Um, what happened? Exactly. Not yeah. any kind of analytical question because one analogy I love in the well-trained 
in mind is this analogy of a sponge. Young children are absorbent. They're like sponges Mm -hmm. because they can absorb new things, but also like an empty sponge that hasn't absorbed much yet. You can't squeeze out what's not there. So don't be asking them questions about like, well, what do you think they should do next? Or, you know, that kind of stuff. Just what happened in the story is good enough at this age. Yeah. Give them books that they can flip through on their own. Even when they're really little and they're not reading, if it's upside down, they're still practicing turning it over and getting excited about reading. I remember my little brother loved to, we had a hymnal in our house and he would just sit there and flip through it and sing in his little baby (laughs) voice whatever he thought was on the page. But yeah, encouraging reading everywhere. And a word, just a word about audiobooks, which has been Mm -hmm. one of our just very favorite tools with our children. In fact, my husband has been going through and rebuying. He's been on a search to to rebuy audiobooks that we listened to when they were very young, a lot of times uh, read by the author, like, um, Arnold Lobel reading his own Frog and Toad books. Oh, I love those. So many of the sort of the family phrases and jokes that we use Mm -hmm. are based on audiobooks that we listened to with the kids over and over and over again when they were little. And I'll just give you one of my very favorites. So Arnold Lobel's reading Frog and Toad. And there's there's this wonderful scene where where Toad is is afraid that Frog doesn't like him anymore as a friend. And he's desperately trying to get one of his other friends to reassure him. And he says, you know, basically, I, f- I haven't seen Frog in so many, so many times, so many days. And maybe Frog is just Very, very busy. And the friend, which I think is a stork or bird of some kind, says, yes, maybe. And in Arnold LaBelle's voice, it's so clear that that is not, you know, the bird actually thinks, you know, frog is probably blowing him off. And so now all of us, all of the time, will say something like, you know what? I I haven't gotten a bill for that yet. Uh, Maybe I already paid it. And everybody else will be like, yes, maybe. So, you know. It's just a way in which listening to audiobooks together can sort of even give you a family vocabulary, Mm -hmm. something that you all share. I'm such a fan of audiobooks. They don't have to understand everything that they're hearing. Mm-hmm. Play them audiobooks that are above way, what you think are above their comprehension level, mm-hmm. and it will tend to bring their language skills up. And you'll, yeah. be, you'll be amazed how much they'll retain and reproduce. Right. And that is one of the fun parts about audiobooks is that you can enjoy them as a family. Younger kids can listen to something that they couldn't read themselves. Um, and, and older kids can enjoy things that they may not choose for themselves. I, my family was the same way. We used to listen to a lot of audiobooks in the car and we have our own little family phrases. One of them actually comes from the story of the world with Jim Weiss, who, if you've listened to Jim Weiss audiobooks, they're, they're, they're amazing, but he has a very distinct voice. And there's one, it, it's the title of a chapter, I believe, where he goes, the long journey. <laughs> and anytime we were going anywhere, if it was going to be more than two hours, somebody would have to to bring up that phrase and use it. So it, it does create a really fun <laughs> family bond when you get to, to listen and, and read books together. I do love that. Well, Susanna, we could probably talk about this um, for a very long time, but mm-hmm. why don't we wrap up and let's do a sort of what I would think of as a basic, what should my kid know before first grade? And if they know these things, they're absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with holding a pencil. Yep. Holding a pencil. Holding a pencil is harder than it sounds like, by the way, Mm. just to make sure that you hold it properly. And there's a reason why the classic pencil grip is the classic pencil grip. It's because it's the grip that stresses the little hand the least. So sometimes it's tempting if a kid is kind of like grabs, you know, like, you know, makes a fist around the pencil and is really enthusiastically writing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you you think, well, maybe I shouldn't interrupt them. You actually should and make sure that they're holding it properly. And one of my mother's recommendations was to put a pencil grip. Have you seen these like little rubber pencil grips that actually move the fingers in the right direction on every pencil within the child's reach? And that Mm -hmm. way... You know, they just get into that habit. That's a good one. The next one would be letters and their sounds. So as they're starting to talk, they'll be ready to learn their different letters. And once they've learned their letters, they'll be ready to learn their sounds. And then you're just really close to to starting phonics and reading. Some students before first grade will be ready to make that next step as well, to put sounds together into words. But not all of them, but not all of them. So that's why we're saying before first grade letters and sounds, but notice that we didn't say beginning reading because some kids are ready. 
Many right. kids are ready, but not all of them. And that's totally okay if they're not ready. Absolutely. Then, of course, number three would be counting. They should be able to count to, I would say they should be able to count to, <laughs> this sounds a little arbitrary, 31. <laughs> mm-hmm. The reason for that is that gets them through, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It gets them through the teens. It gets them through the idea of adding the numbers to another number. So you mm-hmm. go from 20 to 21, 22, 23, 24. And then you get to 30, 31. Oh, light dawns. This is what we do with every single you know set of 10 numbers. Mm-hmm. So if if you can count with a child up to 31 as many times as possible before first grade, you're Mm -hmm. really setting them up well for success in math. And then as we've said, counting in twos, counting in fives, counting in tens, they -hmm. don't need to understand exactly what they're doing. They just need to have that familiarity with it. Absolutely. And then the next one is doing very simple math sums. But what we mean by that is not necessarily they can get a worksheet and answer all the questions correctly, but that they understand that connection between the real world and numbers. And they know if I have one cookie and mom gives me another cookie, now I have two cookies. Those types of things can be really helpful. They're they're developing the kind of math thinking skills that's going to help make things click once they're doing formal school. Absolutely. Now, that's not very complicated, people. Um, Listen, don't forget that preschoolers are actually just learning how to be alive. You know, a huge amount of their energy is going into things like, you know, eating and getting most of the food in their mouth and not all over them. Uh, Tying shoes, planning to go to the bathroom so they don't have to suddenly go to the bathroom when they're out and they have to go to a big, scary, strange bathroom. Um, (laughs) You know, there are so many things that are complicated about being a preschooler Mm -hmm. that formal academics should not be a major focus of what you're doing. So pencil, letters and sounds counting, very simple math sums, and then whatever else they are interested in. Don't overbuy. Don't spend huge amounts of money on a curriculum. I promise you, you're going to need that money later on. (laughs) And do try to enjoy these frantic messy, tiring years. Absolutely. And and just remember that all children are different. If your child is, is not doing all the things that another four-year-old is doing, that is so normal and so okay. So I hope we've relieved um, maybe some of the pressure that you might feel as the parent of a preschooler. And um, we really, really hope that you enjoy those little people. Absolutely. And that concludes our episode today. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. Your thoughts on classical education, home education, school education, or any kind of education that interests you, you can reach us at podcast at welltrainedmind.com. Thanks for listening. 